All right, welcome to our introductory video series. This is actually the first of a number of videos um, that are designed to give you an overview of what the MCAT is about. This video just talks about the MCAT, um, introduces you to the MCAT, what the purpose of the MCAT is, why it's administered, what you can expect, how to prepare, and so on and so forth. But most importantly, because the MCAT has changed since for the first time in a very long time, um, a lot of the material that you will find online now doesn't apply. So of course there are a lot of questions and so the purpose of this video is to answer whatever questions you might have about this updated 2015 MCAT exam. All right, so let's begin, shall we? What is the MCAT? Well, the Medical College Admissions Test, it is a standardized test and it is for pre-medical students um, so that they can demonstrate that they have the aptitude to succeed in a medical program. Now the MCAT, by design, it's very difficult. Um, a lot of people think that among the standardized tests, this is the most difficult, right? So we have PCAT, DAT, um, the GRE for graduate um, school education, lots and lots of options, but many, many people think this is the tough one. In my own experience, I think it's not so much that the MCAT is more difficult than the other exams. It's just that the MCAT is structured a little bit more differently than what we're accustomed to with standardized tests. And I think that's why when we encounter or see the first MCAT, we go, oh my goodness, what is this? All right, so the MCAT is designed for you to demonstrate aptitude. Now, most pre-medical students will major um, in the natural sciences. So, of course, if you've taken biology courses, chemistry courses, biochemistry, organic chemistry, and so on and so forth, you do have uh, more familiarity with the topic. Now, it is debatable whether or not this familiarity means you'll do better on the exam. There are people who major in French and music and theater, and then they just complete what's called the pre-medical curriculum. The pre-med track just means um, a sequence in biology, a sequence in general chemistry, a sequence in organic chemistry, biochemistry. And some schools will add a few more courses to that. Oh, and a sequence in physics. That's just a pre-medical curriculum. That's all it is. But you can do that, of course, without majoring in the natural sciences. So the MCAT does not penalize you for not having a biology degree or a chemistry degree or a biochemistry degree. You just have to be familiar with the content of the, the core um, natural science courses that I just mentioned. However, this new MCAT has a new section that doesn't have, um, that isn't based solely on the natural sciences, and I'm not talking about a critical thinking, so shall we continue? Absolutely. So the purpose, I've already kind of said that, right? It's just to test incoming um, students to see if you have the aptitude. Medical school, it's about being able to take courses, but if you look at the curriculum um, at any of the medical programs, you're not going to do four years of coursework. That's not how it works. Remember that medical practice, it's a practice. And so the medical profession is a practice, that's what I was trying to say. So in addition to being able to show scholastic aptitude, critical thinking is also very, very important, right? Um, MDs have to make decisions on the job. And so the MCAT is designed to test your ability to think critically. Um, of course, recall is important if you're going to be an MD, right? Um, Recall is very important if you're going to be an MD or a DO, right, if you're going to be in medicine. And so recall is tested on the MCAT, um, you know, recall from these courses I mentioned before, as well as the ability to synthesize information and make predictions, all of these things, and data analysis. So the purpose is to really give students an opportunity to demonstrate that they have what it takes to succeed, not only in medical school, I don't like when people say the MCAT is a test you have to take to go to medical school. It's not just about medical school. The MCAT is more than that. The MCAT is to demonstrate that you belong really in the medical profession because it's testing skills, not just what did you learn uh, in freshman biology. Why has it changed? So I've shown you here, of course, we know this is a nice laptop computer. We're familiar with those. It's what we use. And then I show you a typewriter. The world has changed. And so if you really think about what medicine has become, when you think, okay, if you wake up and you have a sore, what's the first thing you're going to do? WebMD, Google, right? Information is at our fingertips. And so as a result, medicine has to respond to that. Most people nowadays actually go online, do the research <laughs> before they call their, their physician. Um, that's more common than you would think. And so as medicine has changed, um, and the way that the patients have changed, so has the um, underpinnings of medicine as well. Think about this. Biology, of course, there's a lot of biology in the MCAT. Biology as a science has changed. 
um, many years ago, biology, not that, I shouldn't say many, once upon a time, oh, that doesn't sound better. In the past, that sounds more politically correct, biology was more descriptive um, than it is today. You know, it's become more of a quantitative science. Um, and if you think about the applied fields that have emerged from biology, biology, biomedical engineering, some of you probably have degrees in biomedical engineering, bioengineering, bioinformatics, computational biology, all these quantitatively based um, extensions of the pure natural sciences. And so MDs have to respond to that. Uh, medical training, in fact, some of you will probably go into academic medicine as well. The medical doctor has to be able to be quantitatively um, apt, quantitatively uh, talented, quantitatively talented. I like to say that, you know, it's not just about recall, as I've said before. So because the world has changed and the role of the physician will change, I'm sure you guys have done your research. You do see that there are a lot of people becoming for instance, physician's assistants, nurse practitioners, changing the role of the primary care doctor, academic medicine. You do see a lot of MD, PhDs. Some of you will become MD, PhDs. So the MCAT has changed its content and its style to reflect the changes in science, the changes in industry, and the changes in medicine as a whole. And of course, as I mentioned, patients are very different today as well. So the current exam has, or the old MCAT, a physical sciences section, okay, which a lot of us dreaded verbal reasoning, and biological sciences. Then there was a trial section, and the trial section wouldn't count towards your actual score. But things have changed drastically. Instead of having a biological science section, you now have a biological and biochemical foundations of living systems. Now, there is an introductory video that will walk you through in about 10 minutes what exactly you should expect or can expect from that section. It's a little bit intense. So instead of it just being biological uh, science, you're going to be tested here on the biological and biochemical foundation. Think about this. You have to know the biology, right? And when you see biochemical, you think about biochemistry. But there is a big gap for an undergraduate student between biology and biochemistry. To go from introductory biology to take a bio biochemistry course, you have to do some preparation, right? You have to do a general chemistry, then you have to do um, organic chemistry, you had to do the sequence of those, and at some point you took some physics, right? You did all of that, and then you got to biochem. And so by the time you got to biochem, you would have taken a lot of courses. This section actually holds you accountable for everything in between from the biology to the biochemistry, okay? So it's not just let me go grab my bio book and my biochem book. You're responsible for the organic chemistry as well, and the general chemistry, and the physics. And the second section will be the chemical and physical foundations of biological systems. This is tricky. Do you see what they've done? You have chemistry, you found here in chemical, physical, so you know here's your physics. But now you're taking these courses or the content you would have learned in these courses and you're going to apply it to biological systems. That is going to be a challenge. Then here comes the psychological, social, and biological foundations of behavior. Wow. So now you're looking at psychology, sociology, and how these things are integrated with biological knowledge to explain human behavior. I must point out that this section also has a public health flavor to it. You're going to have questions about population health, questions about maybe epidemiology, there's statistics, there are all those things in it. So there's also a video series to explain that for you as well. And of course, the CARS section, which is a critical analysis and reasoning skills. It's a little, it's set up a little bit differently from the previous three sections, but here you're going to have to demonstrate that you can read passages in the humanities and the social sciences and still use scientific or critical thinking and reasoning skills to correctly answer questions. So this exam, it's much, much more comprehensive. You see, let's go back to the previous list. You had a physical science section. Okay, I know I gotta do my chemistry and my physics here. Uh, not quite. Now you're taking this physical science section has become the chemical and physical foundations of biological systems. So you're taking this and you are integrating it to explain how biological systems function and maintain themselves. And for the biological science, it's not just biological science anymore. Absolutely not. It is biological and biochemical. So you remember to go from biology to biochemistry, it was a long road. You're responsible for everything in between. So the exam has these foundational concepts. They're like these big um, umbrella um, type statements. And if you remember um, in your curriculum when you were being trained, you learned certain paradigms. For instance, in biology, one paradigm is that structure or form will determine function. Another governing paradigm in biology is the concept of evolution, evolution um, theory. So these big ideas, 
That's what these foundational concepts are. And then within the foundational concept, you have the content categories, which are the topics and subtopics. So if one foundational concept is about um, biomolecules and how they maintain structure and function, that's actually foundation concept 1A. Um, if one of those foundation concepts is that, about biomolecules, then you know in the subtopic you're going to have proteins and how they function and different types of proteins, so like enzymes and then like um, uh, receptors, things of that nature. So you see how that works. Broad paradigm and then subtopics. Now, if you look in the preview guide, you'll see lots and lots and lots of pages of subtopics. Don't panic. A lot of this stuff, it, it overlaps. So as you start to study for one thing, you'll be concurrently studying for something else. Now, you're going to be assessed on four basic skills. These are the scientific inquiry and reasoning skills that you'll be held accountable for on this exam. Now, these skills, the first one will be knowledge of scientific concepts and principles. Let me explain something for you. Um, the natural science section, as well as the section for psychology, sociology, and health, they have this is the following format. You have passages, but you also have freestanding questions. With the freestanding questions, you're basically going to have to apply knowledge of scientific concepts and principles, meaning you need to know this before you sit down to take the test. Okay, so that's where the studying comes in. You're expected to have this knowledge at the time of the exam. Then there's scientific reasoning and problem solving. You'll have passages and you'll have to use this skill set to answer questions from the passage. Do not be surprised, however, if you also have freestanding questions that require this skill. Because you could be given something like, so-and-so did an experiment and they got this result. Which of the following is the most likely explanation? So even though you're using scientific reasoning and problem solving in that question, you would have still need to have some knowledge of scientific concepts and principles. So these kind of overlap, especially in those freestanding questions. Reasoning about the design and execution of research. Many of you, I'm sure, have done some research in preparation uh, for your application to make it look really, really good. Now you need to show them that you spent that time wisely, that you weren't just in there to get it on your resume, that you understand how research is done. As I mentioned, academic medicine. That's an option. Some of you will go down that road. So you'll be asked questions about the design and execution of the techniques and methodologies used by the experimenters um, in the passages that you read. Last but not least, database and statistical reasoning. Some of you would have taken a biostatistics course. We will offer for you actually a little crash course in stats just to get you ready for the exam. But remember, database and statistical reasoning is very important. This is a skill that you'll have to apply in the physical, oh, look at me saying the old thing, the chemical and uh, physical foundations of biological systems, as well as the biological and biochemical foundations of living systems. Very broad, right? You'll have data and you'll have to interpret data. And this can also be freestanding questions as well as from passages. And you'll also have to use this in the psychological, social um, components of human behavior section as well. So you'll be prepared to interpret data. That's why I said, remember, these sciences have become very quantitative over the years, and that's one of the reasons the impact changed. So here's an example of the layout for you. We have a question. We have the answer choices. I've given you that the answer is D. This is foundational concept number two. It's from the biology section or the biological and biochemical section. And then you have a content category 2C and a skill number one. So this is, if we, I can show you, if we go back, oops, I went too far back. Here's skill one, knowledge of scientific concepts and principles. So if this is a skill one um, question, you're supposed to know the answer. The answer is not on the exam. That's what that means, okay? Content category 2C. So let's see, the levels of cyclin and CDK proteins. I won't read the whole thing. Um, this has to do with cell division. And one of the things about tests, like all of this ex extraneous information, that's not really necessary, right? Um, cell division, CDK, cyclin, I would jump to the bottom where it says these proteins are therefore observed in what stage of the cell cycle. See, I wouldn't even read all of that. <laughs> you don't need to. Cyclin and CDK, you should automatically think, aha, cell division. You remember that from class. You took cell biology, you remember this. Or molecular and cell biology combined, depends on what school you went to. And you recognize these proteins. And you know that these proteins are involved in cell division. And then the real question is, these proteins are observed in what stage of the cell cycle? Bingo, interphase, when the cell is preparing to go through division, right? Interphase, preparation. You know, an interphase, you remember, has all these different stages. Notice that the G2 phase is listed, and you know G2 is a part of interphase, but we will go through all of that in later videos. This is just to give you an idea of the layout of the exam. So here we have the foundational concept, the content category, and the skill. How do you prepare for this? 
don't freak out. <laughs> That's number one. Plan ahead. Please plan ahead. Don't start studying for the MCAT two weeks before. Now, of course, some of us are geniuses, or some of you are geniuses, and you can do that. But if you're not the genius who can do this for two weeks, put down two to three months, I would say, where you devote your time to this exam. Um, practice this exam. One of the things about practice, I'm not a psychologist, but I can tell you this. If you familiarize yourself with something, you know, then you become more comfortable with it. And so if you sit down and take the exam after taking many practice exams, you, your stress levels will be lower and you'll probably feel a lot more relaxed in that environment, in that setting. You practice. Um, come up with a plan. Everybody won't use or every one of us can't use the same techniques and strategies. Figure out what your strength is. Obviously, if you have a strength in physics, you probably don't need to spend as much time on physics. Maybe your, your weakness is chemistry. Maybe it's general chemistry, but you're really, really good at organic. We're all different. Find your weaknesses and find your strengths. Um, a lot of times I do notice some students, they focus so much on their weaknesses, they completely um, ignore their strengths. Make sure your strength is up to the par of the score you're trying to get. In other words, you might be strong in biology. That doesn't mean you don't practice the biology. That means you should aim for a perfect score in that section because that's your strength. So balance your time and take a holistic approach to this. Don't stay up the night before cramming. That's not going to work for this kind of exam. Practice, pace yourself, relax, form study groups. We will try to guide you along the way. You can always contact us with questions. We'll answer them. Just do your best, but pace yourself. And most importantly, you have to believe in yourself. Okay, You have to believe in yourself. So books, materials, there are a ton of stuff that's available online, especially for the older exam. As this new exam comes out, a lot of companies are going to offer a lot of things. You have to find the combination that works best for you. Okay, And most importantly, be confident in yourself. It can get very costly. Um, that's OK for some people. That's not OK for others. Find the combination of um, practice exams, um, test prep material, um, just everything that you need. And of course, if you've taken these courses, the biology, the introductory biology, general chemistry one and two, organic chemistry one and two, and the biochemistry, and you have your textbooks, dust them off um, and use them. Textbooks are a wonderful resource. And the reason I say that is, yes, we can go online and search Google and find information, but textbooks present everything in a nicely organized fashion. And so a textbook is like a wonderful reference book for you as well. All right, so that brings us to the very end of the introductory series. As I said, the MCAT is a pretty cool exam. Um, the new MCAT is challenging. But if you really devote the time that it, you know, it will take for you to prepare, you can do very, very well on this. We're here to help you, and I wish you, wish you much success on your endeavors as you embark on this journey to becoming a doctor, MBDO, or any of the above. Um, happy studying, and I'll see you in the next video.